two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula Podcast with James and Mark. Good morning. Good afternoon. Well, what is it? It's just afternoon. It's midday. It's one minute past five minutes past 12 uh, GMT. The confusing GMT, that's right, isn't it? Yes. cusp of Anto and Post Meridian. Um, how are you? I'm all right. Yeah, I'm fighting off a cold. I've been uh, been so busy over the last 10 days. It always happens when we launch things. Uh, it's just kind of, yeah, uh, James is holding up some, uh, some, some medicine. Yeah, so we're both under the weather a bit. It's just because we work so hard. Um, not that we're looking for sympathy. I think it's just that it, it tends to sleep is less prevalent than might otherwise be the case and, and longer hours and that kind of stuff. So also kids go back to school and, and bring you back all manner of biological weapons from the, the, the melting pot of, of primary schools. I think I may have got mine in an aeroplane, which is another place to pick up um, the stuff. And, uh, and, you know, lack of sleep and a bit of, uh, you know, stuff going through your mind doesn't help. You get worn down and you become susceptible to stuff. And then what makes it worse, of course, you get a cold and then can't sleep even more. I think it's as I get older... When I was a kid, I don't remember not being able to sleep with the cold, but I get older, you kind of can't breathe and stuff. And you go to the chemist and or the pharmacy uh, and you realise there's a billion dollar industry in just stuff to stick up your nose, isn't there? I mean, it's Excuse me. A, yes. <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> multi-billion. Not, uh, in addition to that multi-billion industry, a bewildering number of chemicals that... Um, uh, I try to avoid drugs anyway, but I have taken the odd one. Anyway, enough of us moaning. Uh, we are generally fit um, and fighting uh, for survival here in Britain as we go through the machinations of Brexit, which is an exciting distraction to our everyday life, I feel. But, depressing, uh, not exciting. <laughs> it is depressing, um, but who knows where it's going to end. The merry-go-round we're on at the Badly. moment. But probably. Right. But the important thing is that we are future-proofing ourselves. We are uh, talking about establishing digital businesses that operate almost without borders. And uh, where we do have those borders, we get over them quite quickly and we fill in the forms and we will carry on trading, uh, I am absolutely certain, regardless of uh, whether the uh, people who make little black widgets and need to export them somewhere uh, may not have the same easy ride that we have. But we're in a good industry than that. Okay, we should say uh, that the... Uh, premium course mark's flagship course mark dawson's advertising for authors uh, is still open at the moment and you can go and check out that course if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash ads for authors and uh, it's gone really well it's always exciting to get um, a crop of new students on they're flooding into the uh, the mastery the support facebook group at the moment we're seeing lots of photographs of people's workstations and their excited first impressions of the course and it's uh, always a fun time for us isn't it yeah, it is. Yeah, we never really know how how um, many authors are going to sign up, and it's always pleasing that there are always a good few of them doing so. So that, yeah, it's been fun. I mean, it's it's as I say, it's been kind of fairly hard work. We've had a couple of I've done a couple of webinars last week with um, Nick Stevenson and Joanna Penn, and then I did a, a Facebook Live after the Joanna Penn one because I do it in the office because the internet here is more reliable than it is at home. It's, I've got to drive home after it, so I'm not getting into bed before much before midnight. Um, and, and weirdly enough, talking for you know from eight till eleven is quite, actually quite it's quite tiring. Um, so yes, been been doing that, but still you know it's good. It's a good. I've got a good presentation that I'm giving, and although this is going out on the Friday, so we're recording this on a Monday. It's going out this Friday. We would have done one for the SPF um, list on Wednesday. Um, so this is um, not all that useful for people listening after it's happened, but it's a, it's a it's a good webinar. It's, um, I'm teaching some stuff about Amazon ads that people don't necessarily know and some, some tactics that are working for me uh, oh, we're, right now. We, we've barely advertised and we're a few days out uh, still. And I could tell you there's almost a thousand people already signed up for that webinar. So it's mm. going to be uh, a really good one, well attended. Uh, it's an excellent webinar. Yes. And there's absolutely pointless us saying that. I'll tell you what we should do though. Uh, have we done this webinar as part of SPFU? No, I know what we should do. Exactly. We, sh we should... Um, this will go on the Friday. So if people are interested in the course, they will still have five days, we think, to take advantage. So we should probably mention that there will be a replay of this webinar. And we're going to, this is me speaking kind of um, off the top of my head a little bit, but we need to come up with a, 
a URL that we can uh, direct people to. So how about SPF webinar? Yes, we can go with SPF webinar. I think <laughs> if we don't, if we can't go with SPF webinar, you and I have to get back together and re-record this. But let's go with selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPF webinar, all one word. And uh, yeah, this webinar that we're talking about, which is excellent. And we've done quite a few over the years with Joe. And Joe was really uh, effusing, 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 effusing? Effusive. Effusive. You can't. If you can't be effusing, you can't effusing, be effusive. No. She was effusive um, about this uh, webinar and how much she learnt from it. Uh, it was. A, it is a really good one. Uh, so there's a bit of the stuff we covered in the masterclass last week, but uh, some detail on top of that. So if you go to yes, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPF webinar, you can watch the webinar that we're going to do in the future. But it'll be the past for you because that's how we roll in time circuits. Like we're broadcasting from a wormhole. Well, yes, yes, my office is a bit untidy, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit unfair. That's it's, really it's, a, it's a interesting webinar, as I said, and when I did it for Joe and Nick. Normally, when I'm talking about advertising, it's in a very positive. This is not an essential part of your business. It should be something you consider strongly. It's important, but it's probably not absolutely essential. Um, which is a slightly more positive message than the one I'm finding myself giving at the moment. Which is, I think, it is now essential. I don't think that you can. Well, let me put it a slightly different way. You you absolutely maximise your chances of doing well as an author if you learn how to advertise. And that may not have been quite so true before, although certainly your odds would be improved. The reason I say that is because of some of the things that we've seen happening with Amazon, um, especially with Amazon over the last couple of months. And Joe, I just listened to Joe's podcast in the car on the way to the office this morning, and she spent about 20 minutes talking about this after the after doing the webinar with me. I think she she had some ideas. And I, I agree with most of the, most of what she said. And, and the gist of it is, your know, sales are down on Amazon.com. For me and for you know lots and lots of other authors who've contacted me, well over a couple of hundred, um, seem to happen around about the same time and seems to be around about the same amount, about 30 to 40% from the middle of September. And um, you know we can, we can speculate as to why that is. I don't know. Amazon hasn't told me. I have asked, but I haven't got a, 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 any kind of conclusive answer yet. My best guess is that it's because of um, also bought, which are the, uh, the visible manifestation of their recommendation engine, uh, that telling readers, readers of this book also bought this book. It's, it's a great way to, to get a recommendation from Amazon as to what else you might like to read. Those have seemingly disappeared or are in the process of disappearing in the U S so I, I have mentioned this in the email before that, that goes out with this podcast, and quite a few said uh, email back and said, what are you talking about? I can still see them. Um, well, Amazon split tests, so you might be able to see them, um, but others might not. So I, I know that these are certainly – they're not available in my books at the moment, or most of them, and I think this is something that's happening more, more generally. So if that natural visibility, uh, which is perhaps an underestimated – it presses underestimated in terms of importance. If that's going away, we need to find a way to to fill the fill the, the gap. And and that carousel of also bought, coincidentally, it's now a carousel of sponsored posts. So uh, in other words, we need to pay in order to get those books on onto that carousel. Um, and you know, the way I would that sounds kind of uh, slightly apocalyptic, but the way I would dress it up is to look at it as an opportunity, because most authors will not, will either won't notice will go, why have my sales gone down? Um, or if they have noticed, that they'll think, well, I'm not getting involved in mucky commerce and advertising and promotion. I'll leave that to um, the snake oil salesman. Um, that's fine, right? Because that leaves it, the road is clear for people like us who know that advertising is necessary. Um, if it can be done properly, it's certainly not sleazy. It's necessary to get our books out there so that readers can see them. And I think that that puts us into a great position effectively to eat their lunch. So if they're not prepared to, to, to you know, to learn how to do it and to compete, well, we're going to, we're going to ride all over the top of them. Yeah. And you're in exactly the right place to, to learn all that stuff. And that URL again for the detailed webinar on this subject is selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPF webinar. And before you email us, tell us that the also bought are still there on your page. Uh, it is something that's clearly being implemented and rolled out around the world at the moment. So yes, you might see the also bought, but uh, it's changing. 
Good. Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, almost every big change that, and we always see this. There's always somebody in one of the Facebook groups. Sometimes are, sometimes others who who cries panic at the top of their voice. There was a famous panicking character in a British sitcom. Um, played by Clive Dunn, wasn't it? Don't panic, Mr. Mannering, about everything that happened. And um, you are always the person who weighs in and says, first of all, don't panic, things change and we adapt. And second of all, works out the opportunity uh, that this has presented for us. And, um, you know, we were joking about, uh, we have to joke about Brexit because there's the only way to do it. But actually there are, without question, there will be people smart and savvy who will make a lot of money out of brexit they are the people who work yeah, out by betting work, against the pound yeah they'll bet against the pound or they'll <laughs> they'll work out when to bet for the pound and 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 also they'll they'll look at the trade arrangements that start to and they'll be the ones exploiting them first uh, you want to be one of those people you want to be at the, the top of this the head of the game not the ones going oh woe is me this is terrible nothing's going to be the same again there's always opportunity and amazon makes money because authors sell their books on there they, you know they're not going to spoil that fundamental uh, uh, at any point soon good okay now talking of being successful we have a super um inspirational interview today now we had octavia randolph on a few weeks ago uh, and we got lots of really positive feedback it was lovely to, to go and meet up octavia um and uh, the feedback for her interview was really warming because people liked her loved her story and felt inspired by it well i think people are going to have the same experience uh, today with a young man called shane silvers uh, who's already quite well known in his own sphere to the point where he's had his own con it's been Shane Silver's con it wasn't called that it was named after something in one of his books uh, he's an urban fantasy author uh, he is a classic case of somebody who uh, a bit like your own story Mark was bumbling along not making any money I think he says in the interview made something like bumbling 50. along well you were in terms of sales before the indie uh, thing hit you uh, in the face with a brick um, I think he said he made something like $56 or something the month before uh, your course is mentioned here because like many people a bit like Octavia as well it was it unlocked it for him this world of, uh, of advertising and indie um, promotion and he is now a million dollar a year guy and it's exciting he's a lovely chap as well uh, we met him in florida so i was able to sit down with him uh, in a quiet moment during the link conference and so this is shane silvers shane yes silvers yep real name real name Wow, that's a good name. I lucked out. Yeah. yeah, didn't didn't need a pen name. <laughs> you didn't. Uh, welcome to the podcast. We're Thank you. Delighted for to, me. Yeah, well, we're delighted to have you here. Um, you've got a fantastic success story. We couldn't be happier for you, and so we want to hear that in this interview. And I'm also going to talk to you a bit about process and what's working for you marketing wise. So, so take us back. I guess 2012 might be a good starting point yes. for you. Yes. Yeah. So in 2012, um, I wrote my first book. It was called Obsidian Sun, uh, in my Nate Temple series. And uh, I had at first tried to pitch that to a bunch of agents in New York City, um, you know, all the traditional publishing companies. And I, I got a lot of this is good, but no, uh, we've already got a wizard or we've already got a fantasy book this quarter or whatever. Um, and so I just got a lot of rejections. And then that was around the time that people were starting to talk about self-publishing as a good idea. And so um, I gave that a shot, wrote my book, published it. Um, and I did zero marketing, did not have a website, didn't have an email list, uh, did nothing, just so you, published it. And you uploaded it. it basically. And that's it. Yeah. yeah, that's literally it. Um, didn't have a sequel, didn't have any uh, information in the front or the back of the book. I mean, none of it. And so I just waited to become a millionaire thinking mm -hmm. that, that was that was how self-publishing worked. Uh -huh. uh, obviously it didn't. Um, and so I was finishing up school. Uh, I was getting a finance degree to be a commercial loan officer uh, so that I could actually pay some bills if I wanted to keep writing. Um, and so, uh, fast forward three years and I had, I had just kind of gotten the bug again, finished school, got a real job. Um, and I started getting the bug. Okay. Well, why don't I try this again? Now that I know a little bit more about business, you know, I just got a business degree. Um, why don't I give this a shot? So I wrote the sequel uh, a couple months go by. I have a couple, maybe two to $300 months tops in the end of 2015. So still with no real marketing, but you had at least two books. Exactly. Out there. Yeah. Yep. So I had the sequel. That was it. I still didn't have any ads or anything like that. Um, and so I heard about Mark Dawson. He had a Facebook ads for authors course. And I'd been looking at a lot of different uh, courses of any kind on self-publishing and uh, took a couple that weren't necessarily bad, but they didn't help. They didn't really teach you any of the fundamentals. 
And so I found Mark Dawson's course and I really researched him, uh, watched a bunch of his uh, informational material that kind of explained what he does and that he actually has the success to back it up as opposed to the people who just tell you how to win and they've never done it. And so I decided to take a gamble. And so I cashed in my uh, retirement account. Um, didn't tell my wife, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I cashed that in and took his course um, and set aside the rest of the money for anything else I might need for the business. And for the first six months of 2016, um, I built a website, uh, learned about audiences, um, came up with cover material, came up with a freebie novella to give away, um, started signing up for all these promotional services, really, really just everything that Mark Dawson talks about uh, with his launch course um, and how to understand Facebook ads. And so six months later, I had the email list set up. I had all the, the things that I would need to really treat this like a business. And um, in July is kind of when I activated it all and started my ads, $5 a day. And it took off to within two months, I was doing five figures a month wow. consistently. So. so you cashed in your retirement fund. You rolled the dice here. Yes, definitely rolled it, the dice. It paid off pretty quickly. Yeah, it paid off very quickly. So um, July 2016 mm -hmm. started, as Mark suggests, low, $5 mm -hmm. a day and scaled up. Yeah. And sorry, you're doing you're doing ten thousand dollar months within with eight eight weeks. Yeah, yeah. Since then, yeah. Um, so within two months of starting that, I was doing five dollars a day, and then after about a week, um, it started. I said, okay, well, why don't I try ten dollars a day, uh, or seven dollars? You know, I very kind of like you mm -hmm. talked about. I didn't just suddenly throw everything I had into it. Um, I scaled it, you know, rationally and smartly instead of dumping all my money in. Uh, but I started seeing real results, and so um, I doubled down and really just started marketing it. Um, I had ads for you know, newsletter subscribers, I had ads for paid book, um, I had a new release planned and scheduled to come out for book three. Um, so I really just kind of treated it like a business and it started paying like a business. And where are you today? So we're now 2018. Yeah, 2018. So um, I was able to do this full time as of April 2017 on my birthday, April Fool's Day. Uh, so my boss didn't like that very much because he thought it was an April Fool's joke. <laughs> um, but it was just a birthday gift to myself. But I. Uh, Started doing this full time, and since then, I'm um, doing very high, high figures, very high five figures a month. Okay. Very high five figures a month. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're talking um, knocking on six figures. Yeah, yeah. I've, have I've, you had, actually had a six figure month? Mm -hmm. You yes. have. Yeah. Okay. So um, it'll be a seven figure year. For Fantastic. Sure. A million dollar author. Mm -hmm. Well, how unbelievably it's exciting. Crazy. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. And it must have, in some ways, it must have seemed easy to you. We should put a health warning out here that, yeah. you know, Mark's course is fantastic and it's unlocked everything for yes. you, but not everybody. Not a guarantee. Yeah, yeah. takes a course, runs a few ads and suddenly has a million dollars a year um, falling at them. But you, mm -hmm. so Shane, the first thing to recognize is you're obviously a fantastically talented writer. Yeah, I try. Um, yeah, I know well, there's better, but I try. You you clearly are and uh, people love your work, which is, uh, which is great. But, um, Finding that, you know, it was Mark in this case, and let's not spend a lot of time promoting the course in this podcast interview mm -hmm. because uh, people think it's just an advert, although <laughs> it's kind of kind can't of, help but yeah, be an advert you need, the course. you need to give credit where it's due. But, but having somebody like Mark and this Joe and Nick and this others who, who will teach you how to get visible is, it, it obviously is critically important. Of you course. do hear, strangely, you do hear resistant voices to that saying, yes. you don't need this help, everything's out there, you can find it for yourself. But you're living proof that that's not the case. Absolutely. Um, and that's what I was kind of telling you earlier before we spoke. But um, my first book, you know, it, it needed work, it needed, you know, better editing. And there's a couple things that changed, but they were very minor. It was spelling, you know, just proofreading. Um, got a new cover, um, just kind of fitting the genre. But really, the only thing about the actual story that changed was getting it in front of the right people. Um, and that was Mark's course, because that was the only thing that I didn't know how to do, is to get it in front of the right readers. As soon as I did, it, it exploded, it blew up. How has your life changed since you started oh, putting in a million bucks a year? Yeah, it's night and day. Um, it's, uh, it's night and day, because before I was working full time as a banker, so I would have to be professional and wear a suit and walk in and talk numbers um, and then I would sneak away on my lunch breaks to go write or go play with my ads or go do some copy or listen to one of Dawson's, you know, newest, newest cheats on AMS or, you know, whatever, um, quick, you know, podcast that just came out. And so I would sneak away and do that. And then I would go home and I would hang out with the family. And then as soon as my wife and toddlers, you know, toddlers go to bed, I'd go right back to the, to the ink mines and start writing or start advertising or doing that. And so I was, I was working very, 
often, I'd say 95% of the time, 20 hours a day wow. for about a year and a half. So I don't have to do that anymore. And so I still like to because I love the job. Um, but it's gotten to the point now where um, I've found another author like myself that knew how to write, but he didn't know how to sell. And so I kind of turned my, um, my publishing company that I made for myself into an actual publishing company. Um, and so I let him kind of join my world, join my universe, and write his own spinoff series. Um, and since then, um, he launched this July or this June, 2018, and he's, I think he's hit six figures already. Wow. So he's done pretty well too. So do you think that's a direction you might go in and take on a creative so, stable? Yeah, so I know that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of indie presses, I guess you could call them, or vanity presses, that are really trying to get, basically just trying to become the new traditional publishing. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to have 100 authors to take care of. I'd like to take a select few that I can really bank on, um, and not just financially, but that I can trust. And we have rapport. You know, we really get along. Um, and that I know they have the talent. And so I'd probably take a handful of authors that are really ready to work, and I would definitely help them out. So um, you're from Springfield, Missouri, mm -hmm. and you're working as a loan officer. Suddenly, the publishing side takes off. Yes. Um, and what other changes in your life? Well, clearly, quitting the job and being a full-time writer was the biggest thing. What yeah. else has changed for you? Uh, we were able to get a better house. Um, so we moved into a house that's got a lot more land, uh, a lot of area for the kids to go get in trouble. Um, so now we can wake up in the morning and there's you know deer and turkeys and all these things just kind of running around the yard where before we were in a neighborhood. Um, and so we had houses 10 feet away from either side, either direction of us. Um, so now we've got a, you know, a nicer home, more fun. It's got more workspace for me. Um, and uh, got a, I finally got a, a decent car. I got a new car. I was always driving an old uh, Toyota. So what are you driving now? An Audi. Okay. I, got a, I got a nice fun car. So. Okay. And have you told your wife yet that you yeah. uh, cashed in the <laughs> savings account? Yes, yes. I, uh, so after the success, um, I went ahead and showed her, hey, these are the daily sales. You know, I took that course a while ago. Um, you know, here's the results. And so she's like, wow, that is really good. That's, you know, that's awesome. So w how do we make it better? And I said, oh, by the way, yeah. I'm glad you feel that way <laughs> because I actually cashed in our retirement to do this. And so she couldn't be mad then because no. I'd already made the money back, but, uh, but it was funny. It's something we laugh about now. It was a gamble. Yes, it was definitely a gamble. Okay, well, let's talk about the books uh, for a bit then. So uh, urban fantasy, there's something that you have always read and wanted to write or is it yeah. something you chose commercially or so I'd, I'd always been a fan of fantasy in general so there's traditional you know epic fantasy um, which I actually tried originally and I just uh, I couldn't get an agent to look at that um, or to accept it I guess and so I decided okay well what else do I like to read and that would be urban fantasy and so I I wrote my first book and um, ever since then it's been urban fantasy all the way um, so I've got I've got interests and ideas for you know more traditional fantasy or different kind of spin-offs um, into different subgenres or different niches that I might do in fantasy, but urban fantasy is kind of my my favorite. And your lead character, your hero guy, Nate. Yeah, Nate. Yeah, Nate Temple. Um, he's kind of uh, my whole premise with writing is that I would like to take author or uh, characters that have flaws. They're not perfect. They're actually kind of bad. Um, in a way, they're kind of anti-heroes, and they've got a lot to learn and overcome to become the hero that everyone wants to see. And so with my first book, Nate Temple, um, he's kind of like an Iron Man with magic. So he's, you know, he's a billionaire, he's kind of a jerk, um, and he's very elitist. He's, he's got everything he needs, he doesn't need anyone to tell him what to do. And the whole point of the first couple books is to show him that no matter how much money you have, how strong you are, you can always get better and he falls hard and he learns a lot of things in the first couple of books and so the rest of the series is him kind of picking up so it's kind of like a fallen angel story okay where they crash to the bottom and they have to claw their way back up to become a decent human being and so that's kind of the point to all of my characters that i focus on is that they have some major flaw that they're trying to overcome and how much did you plan that from the beginning uh 100 uh, because I, I always got bored with characters that were just so perfect or so soft and so just and I'm just boring to me. There's no room for improvement. But I mean, you planned three books. Um, no, I planned one series for sure. Okay. Um, and I knew that the series would go on for about 20 books. Oh, um, okay. So yeah, my series right now, the Nate Temple series has uh, 10 books out. And the last book, number 10, um, just hit top 25 on all of Amazon on launch day. 
So top 25 in the paid store. Yeah. So, I mean, it would have been easy. You, the way you described the character's journey, you could have done that in a single book, right? And some people yeah. do do that. But you, right from the beginning, you thought, no, he's going to, yes. there's going to be a long way to go. Yes. This. Yeah, it's definitely not an easy path for him. And was that a commercial decision or was that just because you felt this, you wanted to write a series? Yeah, it was personal. Um, it wasn't, I didn't do a lot of market research. I think I just kind of lucked out in that regard. Um, I just wrote something that I would want to see. I, I wanted to see a character that isn't perfect and isn't great. And... They're not the typical helpless person. They start out as the opposite. And the uh, so the big planning is in your mind about potentially 20 books or big series uh, with this character's flawed journey, yes. flawed character's journey. And what about individual books? Do you plot them in detail? Uh, so it's, it's, it's different. So I'll, I'll come up with a very basic outline. Um, and I've got a lot of the you know, the conflicts and the stressors that happen throughout the book. So I, I try to time my book so that every chapter, some kind of conflict happens, whether it's internal, external, um, you know, some character does something that is good for that character, but hurts my, my main character. There's always some kind of conflict in every chapter. And so on the outline side, I'll go through that and kind of have an idea of here's the high points of the story. And then I'll write the book and you know, the, the way I get to those points could change, but the, the main conflicts are still there. And so I definitely outline that. And how many chapters in your books? Um, my books are typically uh, 100,000 words plus, okay. um, right around there, give or take. Um, so that about 50 to 60 chapters most, okay. most often. Okay. Uh, so you've got your points you're going to hit, mm -hmm. and then you get down to write. And how do you actually write how, where, and when? Yeah, so when I write, um, I kind of spend a lot of time on that outline process. So I'll spend, um, you know, two to four days, just depending on how complicated I want, I want to make it, because I really like to twist and mess with the reader. So I'll lead them down a path um, for them thinking that this is how things are going to happen, and then I always twist it on them. Uh, whether it's humor or dark or something, I always twist it on them. And I have a lot of fun doing that. So it's kind of like with a the thriller or suspense, you're always making it worse. Um, or tricking the reader. So I do that a lot. So I'll spend two to four days on the outline. Um, and then when I write, I can typically do probably 10 to 20,000 words a day whenever I, whenever I sit down and write. Um, I'm not one of the authors that sits down and does maybe two hours a day. Like I'll sit down all day and write. Um, so um, I'm all or nothing. I'll have like an ads day and then a writing day. And I, I can't really juggle, juggle all at the same time. So okay. A little different than a lot of people. What do you write in? Uh, Microsoft Word, uh, just because I've always done it. I'd like to use Scrivener. I've heard that there's a lot of cool aspects of that with note taking and kind of linking a lot of plot lines. I know there's a lot of unique things that I could learn there, um, but just ease of you know what I already know how to do. It's Word. Yeah. And then I transfer to Vellum and. Okay. That way. And um, editing. What's your editing process? Yeah. So I've got uh, I've got an advanced team of about 250 people. And so they get, um, I, I write the book, I write the first draft, then I go back through it with a fine tooth comb and just make sure that it's consistent, that I didn't change the shirt color and you know all the silly things like that. And then I'll send it to the editor, they go through it, and then I do kind of a last step where it goes to the advanced team. There's about 250 of them. They get it about 10 to 14 days before launch. Uh, that's what we've done in the past. Um, might be changing some of that up a little bit recently uh, with new launches, but they get, a, they get a stab at it to look at it, read it, uh, critique it, uh, send me any errors that they may have, and then uh, make those changes and publish it. So it turns you do, and you, you have an active reader team? Yes, yeah. Uh, my, my advanced team, the reader's team, is about 250. They're very active. Um, and then I've got a Facebook group that's kind of a street team, more like a just promotion and tell everybody about the book and there's probably I think there's 3,800 people in that group I believe okay so okay so that's the writing process and marketing wise obviously uh, you've re referenced uh, Mark's calls yeah. after all so I'm assuming you run Facebook ads and AMS ads and yes yeah I run Facebook ads um, AMS ads I'm just starting to play with a little bit um, well I say a little bit but I'm doing quite a bit of it now but um, I'm just starting to really understand it better with all the keywords and trying to figure out how what works what doesn't um, what's acceptable, what's not, um, when you are when you want to bid for impressions versus actual sales, and sometimes it's good to just get your name seen. Um, so AMS ads are probably the cheapest way to get your name in front of millions of people. 
whether you actually get a sale from it immediately or not. You're doing the seven touches. That yeah, mark up planting the familiarization in exactly. people's minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good way of looking at it. Definitely, it definitely works on some level, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and you talked about your mailing list. So the mailing list you started right away in 2015. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I started that, well, 2016. 2016. Yep, so about halfway through Mark's course. Um, I was starting to apply all those things and set that up with a you know freebie novella, a permanent free novella. That was kind of a prequel to my Nate Temple series. And so um, I set that up, and I think right now I've got about 20,000 to 25,000 subscribers across the different lists. Um, so um, I had ads initially going for that to kind of build it up. Uh, for the last 12 months, I haven't had any ads um, trying to get new subscribers, but I just got the information in the back of the book. That... You say the different lists. How do you how do you segment your? Yeah, so I've got it segmented down into you know different groups based on interactions. Um, if they're interested in just audiobooks, uh, ebooks, print, uh, different countries maybe, or if they've clicked or non-clicked on certain ads, um, so I'll, I'll start segmenting them out. Um, you know, just depending on what their interests are and what their activities are. Ebooks and and uh, audiobooks, sorry, print and audiobooks. You just mentioned you do both of them for, yes. every, for everything. Yeah, I do everything. Um, I've played with hardback uh, through Ingram Spark as well. Um, the pricing is just not really there to make it beneficial for everyone, the reader especially. You have to price it very high, yeah, um, so that it gets put into bookstores and all that. And so we'll see if I continue that. But and how's audiobook? Audiobook's really good. Um, I do uh, I do about five figures a month. Um, I know there's a lot of room for improvement with audiobook because I think that's the next emerging market. Um, so I think that there's a there's a good chance that, you know, I've even heard of some authors that surpass their their ebook sales with audiobooks. So you know, if that's the case, then I'm very interested in beating my ebook sales with audiobooks because that'd be fantastic. Uh, what social media do you do outside of uh, the sort of paid ads? Yeah, so primarily on Facebook. Um, I'm still learning how to use Instagram, Pinterest. Um, I know Mark and you just had that course with Pinterest ads, and I got to see that a little bit um, ahead of time. But but that was a that's a good course. And there's Instagram. I don't really play on Twitter. I'm there, but I don't really do anything there. Um, but I'm looking into the new the new options. You know, there's Snapchat. There's all all sorts of new apps that people different age categories like and prefer. And so I'm really just kind of looking into those and seeing which ones would be more beneficial. You need to find a 13 year old to help you run yes. the Snapchat Oh, account. tell me about it, tell me about it. Um, I would not do that myself, no. I can promise that. <laughs> um, and do you do any video? No, actually, um, I haven't yet. It's, it's definitely on my top 10 list of doing Facebook Live and different kind of readings and all these things um, that I've seen some authors start to pick up. I think that'd be really good. Yeah, I can see you doing Facebook Live. I think yeah. you've got a nice manner about yeah, you. I people, love, love that. People watching YouTube, I can see that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we did a Facebook Live session this morning and, okay. uh, and talked about that. It seemed to be, I, I mean, I, yes, yeah. I think it is a, um, uh, you know, it's going to be a must have area. And at the moment it's an early adopter area. Yes. So it's yeah. get, getting ahead of the crowd. But uh, yeah, it's easy to do now, easier. Yeah, look forward to seeing some Shane Silver's uh, That'd video be nice. blogs. That'd be nice. That'd be, I'd like it. That'd be very cool. And do you have a lot of interaction with your audience? Yes, very much so. Um, Three spend, men, Facebook? Yeah, definitely on Facebook. So um, I'm always in my group. Um, it's getting. It was getting to the point for a little while that I could not even keep up with them. Uh, because I was trying to write a lot, and so it was taking time away from the group. But I'm sure they'd uh, understand that from the author. They do, yeah, they, they don't mind. Uh, but at the same time, I like being involved with them. And so uh, they're a very active group. I love hanging out with them, talking to them. And actually, because I was so active in that group and I kind of built such close ties with them, they actually held a convention last year in St. Louis um, for me. And so, what? yeah, they actually set it up themselves. And so there was, I think there was over 100 people that showed up kind of last minute. Um, and we had a big blowout weekend and they, they've already got it set up for next year. I think there's going to be a couple hundred people there. So Wow. Yeah. How so, cool was that? Yeah, so that was wild because they said, hey, do you want to do a convention? I said, well, no one's going to come, so I'm not going to do that. If you set it up, I'll show up and lo and behold, 100 people. How did your wife react when you told her that these uh, people are going to hold a convention? For she me? was excited and concerned, obviously. You don't know <laughs> what kind of fans, you know, there's always... Uh, potentially one fan that you maybe don't want to meet. Mm -hmm. um, but no, they were all great. It was such a great time uh, to really get to know them and, and just to hang out with them and answer their questions and um, just kind of be a human for a while, not just some distant author. Because a lot of readers, I think that was the biggest problem, is that readers can't ever get in contact with the authors. Mm -hmm. They're so used to that that 
he's almost like a robot that doesn't exist or an alien that they can't ever talk to. And so the fact that they actually get to shake hands and share a beer with an author, which is kind of what Facebook Live is. Yeah. You get to hang out with them for a minute and see them directly respond to your questions. Yeah. And that's huge. They love that. Yeah. I think so. Facebook Live will work really well for you. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see you do yeah. that. So you've got your own con, Shane con. Yeah. What, what do they yeah, call it? Was, it? it was called Friendsgiving because there, there was a scene in one of my books that was called Friendsgiving. Okay. And so... I had to go with a... So they, they picked that, so it's called Friendsgiving. Sl- a, a slightly more nerdy reference that only yeah. Shane Silver would, exactly. would, would exactly. get. Okay, well, that's really cool. And um, have you had any film companies knocking on, knocking on the door? Um, a lot. Of, there's, there's been conversations. Um, I can't really get into more details than that. Um, I'm definitely trying to, mm-hmm. uh, definitely pursuing it, but I want it to be done right if it is done. Um, so... You know, they're, they're not quick processes. You can get someone one week that tells you they're super interested and then six months go by and nothing's happened. So um, so I'm interested in it. If anyone is interested in repping me, contact me. I'd love to talk to you. But, and your your character, Nate, mm-hmm. where does he come from? He's in St. Louis. Okay. So, well, um, sorry, that's a good answer. It's yep. a very straightforward answer. Um, so I suppose what I mean is... Where does he come from? Is he a bit of you? Is he a bit of your father? Is he someone you knew? Yeah, so a little bit of everything. So I know a lot of authors go in and they try to come up with a character that's them on steroids or better or whatever. So what I try to do is I try to take a lot of my flaws um, and exaggerate everything. And so I I say there's a lot of things wrong with Nate um, that he needs to learn how to correct. Is he a young guy? In- yeah, he's, he's early 30s. So he's, he's uh, and I was 20 something when I wrote it. So he was older than me, um, but he, uh, he's got a lot of flaws. He's very arrogant. He's very, uh, he's a billionaire. I mean, he was raised as that trust fund, silver spoon kid. And so um, I definitely wasn't that, but um, I would have liked to be, it'd be nice. But, uh, but he has a lot of flaws. He's, everything's been given to him. You know, he's, he's always been a strong wizard. He's always got these great things. And so my goal is to show someone who's got it all and then just knock them off their pedestal and then see them have to really learn their flaws to climb back up to the top and be a decent human being. If it did get made into a feature film, who would you like to play next? Yeah, there's there's a lot of fan casting in the group that try to do that. But I think uh, uh, the overwhelming vote so far seems to be Jensen Ackles, which is a guy from the Supernatural TV show. Um, but I think he'd do a really good job, actually. But there's a, there's a lot of people that can do it. If they've got humor, snark, and just they can play the arrogant person. They, so you mentioned well. um, Tony Stark. Yeah. As being oh, yeah. So yeah. Robert Downey Jr. type. Is yeah. it Robert Downey Jr.? It is, yeah. So him and younger. But yeah, that would work. Slightly quirky sort of character. Yeah. Or Ryan Reynolds maybe in Deadpool. Because some people describe the Temple books as uh, Dumbledore meets Deadpool. Mm -hmm. So it's got magic, but also adult version, I guess. Is it humorous? Yeah. Oh, very so. Yeah. There's a a lot of jokes and a lot of twists and puns. And uh, the first first season, or the first season, the first uh, series book... Uh, I'm jumping ahead like a little bit uh, there. Yeah. I'm already talking like there's a film, but um, the first book, he cow tips the Minotaur in the first book. Okay. And that's kind of a thing that happens in Missouri is people go cow tipping and mm. they'll try to... I've heard of this. Yeah, they'll try to knock over a cow. And Have you like, ever tipped a cow? Uh, oh, uh, I can tell straight away he has. Alleged. Has allegedly. tipped a cow. But, uh, but yeah, so I, I, I try to take twists like that. And okay. so... Um, he cow tips the Minotaur in the first book. And then in other books, he does a lot of similar type things with other famous uh, legends and gods, you know, playing beer pong with Hercules or just something like that. So there's always a twist on one of the major legends and they're all major characters in the book. And you've set it obviously in your locality. You're from Missouri. Yeah, what, it's a couple what, hours you away. Live in Missouri. Yeah, it's yeah. in the same state. Um, so I've got Kans- or St. Louis for the yeah. Nate Temple series. And then I've got a, a newer series um, that's, uh, it's called the Feathers and Fire series. And that kind of starts midway through Nate Temple's series. So they, they cross over kind of like the Marvel movies where they're all in the same universe, but they're their own storylines. Okay. And she's in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. So they run into each other a lot and butt heads a lot, and that's kind of fun. Um, did you choose these locations um, beyond them being convenient because you know them? Mm-hmm. Did you choose them for any other reason? Well, uh, well yeah, I did. Um, Missouri's kind of nicknamed the gate, the St. Louis anyway, is nicknamed the Gateway to the West. And so um, with a lot of Western philosophy and Western gods, you know, the Greeks, all these things that I incorporate into my books, um, it was a fun angle to take um, that St. Louis is kind of the start of all this and all these monsters and legends and 
gods and everything are coming to Missouri and everyone's wondering why Missouri is the middle of nowhere. Um, but because it's the gateway to the West, it's kind of a, a fun way to start it. And everyone's got New York or Miami or yeah. some big city. Like I wanted to use something a little different, a little, little bit more unique. And it just happened to be the state that I ended up moving to. Yeah. But, but it wasn't because I lived there that I did it. No. Well, that's, um, that's a great concept, the idea of the gateway. Yeah. Being then these, uh, these yeah. creatures moving through it. Mm-hmm. Uh, just check, you don't believe in this stuff? Could you, any of your fans <laughs> believe this stuff? I, mean, I would love to. The only reason I ask this is because we did interview the guy in New York earlier this year called... John Dyer Prompt, Dracul author. Oh, oh uh, J.D. Stoker. J.D. Barker. J.D. Barker. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who discovered that Bram Stoker did believe in a okay. vampire because he went through his original yeah. notes. He's now, well, Dracul is the, is yeah. the sequel. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so he's a little like, oh, maybe it is real. They, I think his ed- I think Bram Stoker's editor cut out that I'm aspect. Sure. For I'm sure. Or else you're publishing a crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, good. Some of your fans may. I don't know. They could. Yeah. They could, yeah. Um, it's, it's fun, though. I get to take a lot of, uh, a lot of different cultures. So I've got the Greeks, the Vikings, you know, the Norse gods. I've got, I get to play in all the playgrounds of philosophy and uh, fantasy and mythology. And so I get to incorporate all these characters, you know, the Minotaur um, hanging out with Achilles. Um, and, you know, I get to have all these fun aspects. And where do you get all that knowledge from? I mean, who, do you, did you learn classics at school? Yeah. Oh, you did? You had yeah. classics when I was when I was a child, that was my escape, his mythology. Okay. And so I would read, um, you know, Iliad and the Odyssey and any anything I could find on Greek mythology, Norse mythology. Um, and then I did martial arts for a decade. And so I would learn all about Eastern philosophy. Um, and so the martial arts and um, I would get to learn about Buddhism and meditations and all these things and so I kind of just accumulated all these things and then realized well that's that's perfect when you put it all together in one big melting pot Um, and so that's kind of what I've done so all of those main characters show up in my books at some point super have you calculated how many books you've sold so it's it's hard um, because you it depends on if you look at page reads as books because technically they, they could be I mean if you're if you kind of give yourself a average page number mm-hmm. per book I mean people read that entire book and so if you're looking at that um, I'm over a million so um, and if you're looking below that I haven't checked it recently but um, I can definitely say I've had 500,000 for sure yeah but if you count in the page reads it's over a million mm-hmm. how does that feel feels it's just crazy to say it, it doesn't doesn't compute I don't know it just kind of a number and I just want to keep going keep writing does the writing feel different now you've got that success under your belt than it did at the beginning no no I'm having more fun um, I can get I'm, I'm also further in the series though too so there's a lot better understanding of the voice and the characters themselves and the big picture project you know how far away I am from the end um, so I'm much more familiar with the characters and their their weaknesses their strengths and the bad guys and how to do that so the writing has actually gotten easier but my stories have gotten more complex so um, just because the writing is easier I try to really mess with the reader now a lot more so well Shane we're so pleased we bumped into you yeah uh, absolutely here, here in Florida and it's a fantastic story obviously we always like to hear success stories yeah. about the course but yeah. it's just a, a joyful uh, thing to hear that a writer has um, Almost like you've uh, hit that oil world. Yeah. Do they have oil yeah. in Missouri? Yeah, uh, I don't know. Oh, I'm not sure, actually. I think in Texas they do. But... Geezers or geysers. Yeah. <laughs> geezers, we probably have geezers too. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have geezers, yeah. <laughs> well, you still live in Wales, so you know what yeah, geezers exactly. are like. Exactly. Um, so that's great. So we, we celebrate success and we'll, we'll keep track on yeah. how things go in the future. Absolutely. And particularly looking forward to the um, to the Ryan Reynolds miniseries. Yes, I uh, me too. I'll, I'll let you guys know. I'll call you first if it happens. So. I mean, clearly, we have to say, and I think I said it in the interview, the guy writes good books. He does, yes. I, I actually read one of his books on the flight back from Florida, um, and it's funny. He's a good writer. He knows what he's doing. Uh, it's very enjoyable. Um, and, yeah, he, he writes good books. He writes them reasonably frequently, um, and he has spectacular facial hair. <laughs> let's, let's, not, let's not forget about that. He, he has, has a, a good fantastic moustache. He has a good beard and moustache, uh, and he has a good uh, trainer. So he was very. Um, uh, he did attribute his success to you, and the reason I say he's a good writer is just to make it clear that you know you have to have the uh, the product in order to make this work. Uh, and um, I noticed somebody commented on 
the YouTube video from the Amazon Masterclass, the AMS Masterclass last week saying, this is not working because I've run two ads and I haven't sold any books. And now there's a whole raft of reasons to why when you start advertising, it might not work for you, but uh, you do have to look at the products. You have to look at your book cover and everything else. And Shane's an example of somebody who's, who just does this methodically. And yes, he's used your instruction to go through that process and, and position himself. And it's paid unbelievable dividends unbelievably quickly. Yeah, I, I remember seeing his ads actually uh, um, in my newsfeed. Um, and it took me a while to realize that he was a student because um, his ads are brilliant. He has really um, fantastic, um, colorful images that are perfect for his genre. And then his copy is funny as well. So um, talking about cow tipping a minor tour, which yes, just feels that's to me. That's the opening, that I, li- opening line, isn't it? Opening passage of his first yeah. book. Given that I come from places where cow tipping is, is <laughs> something that we, we used to do at night time. Um, and no cows were injured in the uh, filming of this uh, podcast. But no, it's 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 funny. He's a funny guy. And um, those are really effective ads. I, I was pleased to see that they were as effective as they deserve to be because you know they out of all the ones i've seen over the last couple of years his would be up there in in like in the top five um so yeah it's fantastic to see how well he's doing and lovely to see him in florida and he's actually coming to um to bali as well so um be hanging out with him at the 20 books bali conference in january so i'm looking forward to that Excellent. Yes, it was really nice to meet Shane, and he's a good chap to hang out with. I'm sure you'll have fun on the beach in Bali. I will, and I'll tell you all about it. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll try and do it live with you while you're out there. I don't know what time's in Bali. You're going to be ahead. You're going to be ahead of us in the east. Um, yes. Good. Now, I was speaking to someone the other day from Australia, and they said, Bali? Really? You're going to Bali? And their version of Bali is very different from ours. So in the UK, and I'm not sure what it's like in America, Bali summons like Mauritius... Uh, you know, archipelagos in the um, in the Pacific or Indian Ocean, very beautiful sandy beaches. In Australia, it's a bit like saying you're going to Jersey Shore or Ibiza. Oh, lovely! So, I like just, both of those places. Just Sorry. to warn you that um, it might have beautiful beaches, might also be you'll be going down bonkers nightclub uh, on a Tuesday uh, night. No, we won't be doing that. We'll be staying in the hotel all the time. Um, it's a nice they hotel. were talking about excursions. And I'm not going on an excursion. I'm staying in the hotel. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to sleep, aren't you? There will be sleep involved, definitely. This is after Christmas with um, two sets of um, parents, two two children running around, a crazy dog. Um, this is going to be uh, five days of, of recovery time for me and Lucy. I'm going to have to give you a camera and a sound device so you can do some podcast interviews while you're out there. I'll try and train you up. Yeah, yeah, I could do that. You need to do some work while you're there. Good. Okay. I want to say thank you to Shane Silvers, our guest today. And you can support the podcast that you're listening to if you go to patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast. Uh, you can check out the Ads for Authors course if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash ads for authors. Depending on when you're listening to this, it'll close up on Wednesday after this is released. That's Wednesday the 28th is the last day uh, to enroll until 2019, probably summer 2019. I think we'll onboard the next crop of students. And very finally, if you want to go through Mark's webinar, uh, our webinar on AMS ads, which will be available as a replay, you can go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPF webinar. I think that's it. We will uh, see you then next Friday until another week on the Self Publishing Formula podcast. We want to wish you a great week writing and a great week marketing and selling your books. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.